So I know that lots of people have been celebrating things in the last, you know, weeks and months that we weren't able to celebrate at sort of the usual time in the year. So I guess that might've been going on in my brain this week. This might seem like an odd connection. So I'll just kind of acknowledge it up front. As I was reading and studying the the scriptures for today, in particular, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, I started thinking over and over about the Magi, right? The, the wise men, the three Kings from, from that we usually see at January and December. It's odd in the heat of the summer to think of the Magi visiting the baby Jesus with their gifts from afar, but stake with me because I think there's something there. I promise I'll get back to Paul as well. I've been thinking a lot about returning home. And the phrase from that story of the Magi, home by another way, has just been ringing in my head. Home by another way, after an encounter with Jesus. If you remember the this, this story, we don't always focus on it at Christmas. There's a really unnice element to the story. The, the Magi don't just come and meet Jesus on their journey. They first meet King Herod. They seem to expect that King Herod will sort of have the answer to why they've been brought to this land by this star. And indeed, at first, King Herod seems to be a good king who's also seeking the truth. But then they encounter Jesus even in the form of a baby. And then they interpret their own dreams about that experience later. And they seem to realize that Herod is not a good king, that he hasn't told them the truth, and instead he wishes to harm Jesus, who he sees as a threat. So they're changed by this experience. They're changed by this realization. And they return to their home by another way. And we too have been on a journey over the past 15 months, a journey and an encounter with some difficult truths that I think has changed us. This journey has changed us. This journey still is changing us. And I think in a lot of ways, we're with the Magi and sort of turning toward home right now, home to visit with family and friends that we haven't been able to see, home to habits that feel normal, home to this place, our church, our community, our sacred space. And that's all so good, isn't it? It's it's so good. We can enjoy that experience and we we should enjoy those things and, and savor them, not take them for granted. The feeling of going home, the feeling of return to all the things and people and experiences that we missed. But I think with with that moment of, of return that we're in the process of right now, I think an invitation comes with it. Not to rush back to pretending that everything is normal and perfect and okay. An invitation to allow what happened to us this past year to change us, to change the course of our journey. In other words, to go home by another way. This idea of going home by another way, I think is a little bit of a paradox, right? It's a little bit of a both and, a little bit of a mystery. We We want to go home. We want to go back to things that are how and where they were before. And that's good. There's things that are good that we miss that we want to return to. And yet we ourselves are different. It might seem easier to try to forget all the things that happened this year that were unpleasant or difficult to try to push them away, to jump into things that feel good. It can help us bury the grief that's been a part of this year unpleasant realities in our world that this year revealed. It's tempting just to push that aside, to forget it, to bury it. Or more like to paint over it or to wrap it up with a cheery bow. 
And it's a paradox because that's, that's not the same thing as saying that we can't be grateful. We can be grateful for all of these things and acknowledge the hurt, the grief, the wounds that are still healing. Both can be true at once, even if that seems like a paradox. I'll give you a small example of part of where this is coming from in my life. Spent most of the last 15 months doing a full-time job while Miles was also doing a full-time job and we took care of a baby 24-7 at the same time. I'm so grateful for the help that we had and that we made it through and that we were healthy and that we had jobs and a place to live and enough to eat. And I'm even grateful for the extra time that we had together as a family. There were lots of beautiful and joyful moments, of course. It was also really hard. It was just a long time of living with an impossible situation that we had to work at hard jobs and we had to do them and we had to care for a baby all the time because babies can't take care of themselves. Those are just two realities that don't really fit together. And yet we made them fit together. I know I'm still recovering from that. I imagine I will be for a while. My body still has weird aches from stress. And if I don't get enough sleep, I just really have a hard time powering through because I don't have anything in reserve and I get anxious and irritable more often than I used to. Part of the hard thing, I know this is true for everybody, Part of the hard thing about this pandemic is that we were all having this hard experience at the same time. And it was, we were kind of somewhat invisible to each other. I know I'm not the only one who got through what seemed like an impossible thing. But for me, I think what I'm learning about community from that experience is that when I've shared bits of my difficult truth with people, people have what's a natural impulse, I think, to try to make me feel better. Talk about that and people say, oh, but wasn't it so nice to have all that time with your baby? You must be so well bonded. And that's so true. That's very, very true. I loved having that time with my family. And it was also really, really impossibly hard Both can be true. There are so many things like that from this year. The beauty and goodness can coexist with what was hard and impossible. I think it's really important for us to acknowledge both. For one, as Rebecca Bell has been beautifully inviting us to realize all year long in her forums, it's okay not to be okay. And we can hold that better together in community than we can alone, I think. When you're not okay, it really helps to be in a community where people can accept that reality with you and not try to paper over it or shove it aside or avoid it or just try to cheer you up. I think it's also important because if we're willing to be open to it, God can use these painful realities, these wounds, this brokenness for God's healing, for growth, for teaching us how to journey through difficult territory. And here we run into another paradox, another mystery of this life and of this Christian journey. I don't think that God willed the pandemic or any of the painful things that happened this year to teach us a lesson or show us something. I think God grieves all of the losses and the pain of this year along with us. And I believe that God wants love and abundance and thriving for us too. The existence of suffering alongside a good God is is a paradox too. It's an eternal mystery that I don't think any of us will fully understand in this life, and yet we wrestle with it. And in wrestling with it, somehow God is present with us. Suffering and in struggle, somehow God works in the brokenness for our healing 
in our life, in our growth. I don't know how it works, but I know from experiencing it that it's true. And so here we get to Paul, finally. I think this is what Paul is talking about in his second letter to the Corinthians today. He says, as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger. Things were pretty rough for the Corinthians. They lived in a tough city with huge inequality and this kind of rigid military relationship with the Roman Empire. Their community was probably being persecuted by the time this letter was written. And their community was just hard to hold together. Their their city was tough. They had plenty of conflict, both internal and external. Paul names these difficult realities in vivid detail. As I see them, God sees them. But then right next to it, separated only by a semicolon in English, he names the reality of the gifts that emerged from the difficulty of being a servant of God, from being a member of this community of Jesus followers. These are the gifts he names. Purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. All names right next to each other, both sides of this paradox. He doesn't pretend that things are easy or great for the Corinthians, not by any stretch. And yet God was doing great things within them. God was helping them to grow in love and knowledge and holiness and truth right in the midst of that difficulty. Paul wants them to see the truth of that growth, the truth of God's presence in their lives, the truth of God's work in their lives in the midst of pain and difficulty and struggle. And you get the sense that Paul is writing so vehemently because like in our world, there were forces in the Corinthians world and in themselves that that tried to pull them away from noticing those truths, both the difficult ones and the truth of what God was doing were forces that wanted them to choose false gods that would give easy answers, that promise security and quick fixes. They too were being tempted to look away or bury or run away from what was painful. And also not to notice the growth and work of God among them. Paul continues, We are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well-known, as dying and see we are alive, punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. Paul is explaining here this ability to see, a way that a life of faith can orient us differently, can help us see differently than we would otherwise. Perhaps that then this world, then the false gods that we're tempted to chase would have us see. There's a lot of temptation. Try to look away and ignore or paint over struggle and brokenness. And there's a lot of temptation to look for easy answers and false security in our problems. And thus not to see the work of God and the presence of God in that struggle. When you see through these eyes of faith, you can see the life, the rejoicing, the riches that God gives. Even as we face the struggles and pain and grief head on. So to go back to my small example, I've experienced God's work in my life in the midst of the struggles and grief of this year. I'm still learning about that. I'm still unpacking it. I'm still figuring out what it means. But I know that God has been present to me 
in the exhaustion. God has taught me about what's essential on this journey and what can be left behind. God is teaching me about what's worth making a sacrifice for and what's not, what's worth pushing for and what's not. I've learned more deeply how to tell the truth about what justice is, about what healing is, how to prioritize those things. And even though I know all of that, even though I know all of that on a deep level, it's tempting to just rush back to the false idea of of life before the struggle and look back at old times with rose-colored glasses because it seemed easier or more secure. But I pray that God will continue to lead me to go home by another way. I hope that I will be less willing to be tempted by the false gods of perfectionism and overproductivity as those false gods and the people who worship them will just eat you up and spit you out without a second thought. And I pray that I'll be less likely to put my faith in what seems like security, but actually isn't jobs and pursuing what seems like stability at all costs an ideal of peacemaking that doesn't actually lead to truth or justice. I think I'll especially prize and protect and work for the communities that have been strong enough to hold the difficult truths, the difficult paradoxes that this year has offered us. I hope most of all that I can remain committed to expecting to find God in these paradoxes, in the unlikely and painful places, the broken places, because that's where God seems to show up, ready to lead us to healing to growth and to truth and to love. So that's a little bit about where I'm finding God in this. And I'm sure each of you have your own stories of this difficult paradox of a year that we've been living in. Places that have been really hard. It's okay to grieve them. It's okay to need to heal from them. Need rest. And I invite you to to take a moment to allow Jesus to calm the storm. Take a moment of calm just to reflect on where, where God is in that. To ask, even as the disciples did, for God to be present to you. This isn't a way just to try to push away the, the pain and the grief and make something cheerful and meaningful out of what's been a really hard experience. But I think it's a way to honor what's been hard about this year. To allow the pain and struggle of that to be transformed. To allow God to help us to turn it into a tool for our journey. Perhaps a tool that can be shared with others. As our journey to our true home with God never ends. God is leading us to a home that we cannot even imagine, to a place of such love and abundance that it's too big for our minds and experience here to contain. But when we travel on this journey with God, when we open ourselves to God's work, we get a peek at it. We allow ourselves to see how God works, to see more fully who God is. So let us go home together by another way, the way that God leads us.